Good morning, Pastor Ed Kropa here from Hope Lutheran Church in Freehold, New Jersey. And welcome back to our online daily devotions for Monday, January the 4th, 2021. Well, it's good to be back. I hope you enjoyed a, a joyous Christmas and New Year. Technically, technically, of course, it still is the season of Christmas until this coming Wednesday, January the 6th, that is which is the epiphany of our Lord, marked by the story of the, the visit of the Magi. And so this week we're going to kind of straddle these two seasons, Christmas and Epiphany, which of course have a lot in common. Because the story of the Magi in the Gospel of Matthew is very often conflated, especially in our minds, with the story of Jesus' birth in the Gospel of Luke, even though these two events would have occurred as much as perhaps two years apart. Nevertheless, our reading this morning is Jeremiah 31, verses 7 through 14. And in the lectionary, it was assigned for yesterday, the second Sunday after Christmas. But it's not your typical Christmas lesson, however, even for an Old Testament reading of one of the prophets, like the, the readings from Isaiah that we hear on Christmas Eve each year. And yet today's reading of hopeful promises for God's people in exile does serve as a powerful reminder of God's hopeful promises of a Savior born on Christmas Day. However, before we continue with today's reading, let's begin first, as we always do, with the service of responsive prayer, namely the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and Martin Luther's morning prayer. Let us begin. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I believe in God the Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have protected us through the night from all harm and danger. We ask that you would also protect us today from sin and all evil, so that our life and actions may please you. Into your hand, hands we commend ourselves, our bodies, our souls, and all that is ours. Let your holy angels be with us, so that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Amen. Almighty God, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Well, here's today's reading. Again, Jeremiah 31, verses 7 through 14. For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor together. A great company they shall return here. With weeping they shall come, and with consolations I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble, for I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, He who scattered Israel will gather him, and will keep him as a shepherd, a flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob, and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion. They shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. 
and then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. As I was preparing uh, for today's daily devotions, I came across um, a piece that was written by a, a Jennifer Benjamin Brooks, who teaches um, at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary in Evanston, Illinois. Um, she's actually from the East Coast, uh, I, I discovered, actually did her uh, PhD at Drew University, uh, which is where I did my Doctor of Ministry degree, so I feel a, a little uh, something in common uh, with her. Um, but she writes this, these verses, speaking of the passage I just read, offer real good news to a people longing for it, she says. They are words of hope and restoration, a message of joy and praise. But there's a catch. This is not a statement of facts. It is an oracle, a promise yet to be fulfilled, a description of things hoped for. Jeremiah is ever hopeful, and his message is delivered to a people sorely in need of hope. The context of the text is that the exiled people of Israel, who have suffered long in captivity and eagerly welcome the prophecy of a divine promise of release and restoration. But the prophecy is appropriate to the situation of many in the present society, meaning today, who are exiled from the largesse of society and feel hopeless about the challenges confronting them in their daily lives. I think I may have commented on this before, but this, we've had, since I've been doing the daily devotions, I never really noticed how much um, we go back to the Old Testament and the, and the stories of uh, uh, the, the God's people being in exile. And I guess what struck me is that all these months now, um, since the pandemic hit, it feels as though we're living in exile. We, we're separated from each other. We're separated um, from our connections, we're, we're separated the, the, the most, for most of you, not for me, I still come to church every day and I'm here on Sunday mornings, but we're, we're separated from, you know, from this building, not that this is the church, but this is, this is the place where we gather as God's people. And so it's, it's easy to, you know, to resonate, to have these passages resonate with us because we're going through a very similar kind of a thing. Um, and the key is, we'll come back, we've talked about this before, and I'm undoubtedly come back to it again. The key is hope. The key is having hope, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. Uh, Chuck Swindoll once wrote, We can live several weeks without food. You may have used this before. Days without water, but, and only minutes without oxygen. But without hope, he says, forget it. The philosopher Immanuel Kant said that there are three questions that everybody asks. First, what can I know? Second, what shall I do? But third, for what shall I hope? You know, hope is, is this critical thing. It's interesting that we are Hope Lutheran Church. And that was in 1967. That was kind of a unique kind of uh, uh, progressive name for a congregation, especially a Lutheran congregation. Everything was St. John's and St. Matthew's and and St. Paul's, but this was Hope Lutheran Church. Uh, Dr. Emil Brunner said, What oxygen is for the lungs, such is the hope for the meaning of human life. Take oxygen away, and death occurs through suffocation. Take hope away, and humanity is constricted through lack of breath, despair, and hopelessness set in. Uh, Craig T. Coker, who is a a chaplain, I forget now where exactly he serves, um, once wrote that Christian hope is fundamentally different from optimism. He says, Christian hope lacks its locks its steely eyes on the devastation of the world around it and readily acknowledges that things may not get better. Christian hope does not bury its heat in yuletide cheer and artificial lights, but like an advent wreath glowing stronger and brighter each week, this hope pushes its way into the brokenness of the 
world, clearing a path in the wilderness so that the true light may burst into the darkness. Coker then goes on to cite a story by Tom Long about a rabbi, Hugo Grin, who was sent to Auschwitz as a little boy. In the midst of that concentration camp, in the midst of the, the death and horror all around them, many Jews held on to whatever shreds of their religious observances they could find without drawing the ire of the guards. One cold winter's evening, Hugo's father gathered the family in the barracks. It was the, the first night of Hanukkah, the Jewish festival of lights. And the young child watched in horror as his father took the family's last pad of butter and made a makeshift candle using a string from his ragged clothes. He then took a match and lit the candle. Father, no, Hugo cried. That butter is our last bit of food. How will we survive? We can live for many days without food, his father said, reminiscent of what I shared just a moment ago. We cannot live a single minute without faith and hope. This is the fire of hope, said his father. Never let it go out. Not here, not anywhere. Hope. Apparently they still tell the story at William and Mary College of a daffy, magnificent President Benjamin Stoddard Ewell. For a century and a half, you see, this prestigious Virginia school had been a leader among American universities. But then came the Civil War. And in the hard days of Reconstruction that followed, William and Mary went bankrupt. Soon it had a deserted campus, decaying buildings, no students. As with so many Southern schools after that tragic war, everyone wrote it off as dead. Everyone except its president, President Yule. He had given his best years to advancing the liberal arts through that school. He, he refused to give up now. And so every morning, President Ewell went to the deserted campus, climbed the tower of its main building, rang the bells, calling the school to class. He behaved as though the school was still there. People thought he was crazy. Nevertheless, every day for seven years, President Ewell rang the bells at William and Mary in defiance of the despair and hopelessness that would destroy everything that he held valuable. Eventually, miraculously, it worked. Others caught his vision. Students, teachers, and money returned. And today, America's second oldest university thrives once again because of the hope of a single man. Hope is so utterly critical, especially because the world um, often seems hopeless. Um, that pastor who wrote the commentary that we opened with closes with this. The oracle of Jeremiah is written to the exiled people of his day, but it's also written to the exiled people of this and any day. Whatever has divided, segregated, or separated the people of God in any way from one another has been overturned. God has made us all one, and the reunion of the family is a time of joy. In Christ, we have the promise and the opportunity of unity with the whole people of God. In this season, we are invited to join this celebration of unity and life through the promised salvation that God offered to us in Jesus Christ. Well, I hope uh, you have a great day. It is good to be back with you and uh, look forward to spending some time with you again tomorrow morning. Take care. Bye.